I'm Dr. Maria Valdez. I'm a research scientist at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, um, and I have joint affiliation too with the University of Chicago. Um, I consider myself a cosmochemist, which means that I use uh, primarily meteorites, but other solar system material to understand uh, in a chemical way, the origin and evolution of the solar system. Definitely grueling, uh, and I will say this was the first field work I've ever done. Um, I kind of went from zero to 100 really fast here. Uh, obviously very cold, uh, very windy. We lived in tents a lot of the time, spent long hours outside. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes the conditions were, were almost too bad to go outside, and so we had to... Uh, either um, stay in the tents or spend a few extra days at the base camp at, at Princess Elizabeth Station and, and wait for storms to pass. Um, yeah, but, but it was also just really fun. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. That's, that's a good question because I, I think to a lot of people it can seem like, why are you putting yourself in these extreme conditions <laughs> to find um, meteorites? Um, and in fact, meteorites do fall uh, at the same rate in Antarctica as they do anywhere else in Chicago, for example. Um, but what makes Antarctica so great for finding meteorites is one, it has a very simple backdrop. It's, it's basically all snow um, or ice. And so a black rock uh, on the snow or ice is, is much easier to see and identify than it is here in Chicago. Um, but there are also other processes that make Antarctica a really good accumulation zone for meteorites. Um, and basically, uh, when meteorites fall onto the ice, they can sink into the ice after a few years or so. And as the glaciers move towards the, the coasts of Antarctica, they will sometimes um, hit a uh, a topographical obstruction underneath, and it will cause the ice to move vertically and all of the meteorites that were under the ice to be resurfaced, re-exposed to the surface, and um, we call these meteorite stranding zones. Uh, and so sometimes you can find great accumulations of meteorites in a small area in Antarctica. Yes, it is. Um, I think about 45,000 meteorites have been found in Antarctica so far, uh, but only 100 or so are the size of the one that we found or larger. Uh, generally, they break up on their way into the atmosphere, and so um, it's pretty rare to find one this big, yeah. Um, I will say initially it was, it was a little difficult just because some of the areas that we were searching um, at the bases of mountains had a lot of, um, you know, pieces of that mountain that over time have, have broken off and just fallen to the base. And a lot of these are dark colored rocks and look meteoritic. Um, but once your eyes get adjusted after a few days and, and uh, you find one or two, then, uh, then you can, yeah, go from there. Um, it's what we're looking for uh, in the first place is a dark fusion crust around a rock. Um, a fusion crust is essentially a glassy coating that develops on the meteorite as it enters our atmosphere. And this is because it's entering at such high speeds that the friction is heating it up and actually melting it a little bit. So the outside turns into the it, it's melted and it quenches really fast when it gets into our atmosphere and turns into glass. Um, and then depending on how long it's been on the surface of earth, um, this glass can either be very well intact, um, and that's if it's fresh, if it's only been on the surface of earth for a little while, or it can start to wear away in the case of the large one that we found. Um, it's probably been on earth for several thousand years. And so the coating is starting to wear away a little bit, but it's still there, it's still obvious. Um, you're also looking for a rock that's quite heavy for its size, generally. Um, and this is because meteorites are, are pretty metal rich. And so, for example, the 17 pound one that we found is 
smaller than a bowling ball, but about double the weight of a bowling ball. Um, and then we can also do other tests like magnetic susceptibility to see if it matches up with magnetic susceptibilities um, in a database of meteorites that's already been established. Um, and these are just like visual and initial tests that you do right in the field. The reason we use meteorites in cosmochemistry is because uh, meteorites hold in their chemistries um, records of the early solar system. Uh, they're essentially windows into our very distant past. They record the conditions of, of what the solar system looked like and was made out of four and a half billion years ago when they formed. Um, we can learn things about where in the solar system they formed, um, what kinds of stars were contributing material to our solar system back then, um, how their parent bodies formed, how their parent bodies evolved and moved around the solar system over time. And this is all locked up in their chemistries. And so the more samples we have, the clearer of a picture of what the, the solar system four and a half billion years ago looked like. So we're always trying to get more samples, always trying to round out that sample set.